We'll begin today with the first book of our New Testament, at least as we have it ordered, the book of Matthew. Of course, Matthew is one of the three synoptic gospels, which is to say Matthew, Mark, and Luke are very similar. They run in the same direction, and so we call them synoptics. And then Matthew is the one that appears first in the traditional order that we use. Now, uh, the traditional order is not necessarily part of inspiration. In the case of Matthew, I would say it's very appropriate that Matthew is the first book of our New Testament. And there's a reason for that. It's a very fair description of Matthew to call it a bridge between the Testaments, to say that Matthew connects intentionally the Old Testament and the New Testament, links both of them together, and shows that specifically Jesus, his life, his death, his ministry, and his resurrection are the fulfillment of what the Old Testament predicted. Jesus Christ fulfills the Old Testament. And in that sense, then, Matthew becomes a bridge between the two Testaments. Now, let me, let me um, actually support that assertion, and let me talk about why that's true. Let's start out here, just as a foundation, with, at the very beginning, the first chapter of the book of Matthew. And I'm looking here at Matthew chapter 1, so the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Um, I'll just highlight for us initially the very first word of the book. And this is really a, a beautiful introduction into the richness of what Matthew will proclaim for us. The book starts out, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Okay, a couple of things to notice about this verse. Number one, the book of is going to kind of, it's going to call your attention back to specifically Genesis. And even the generation of Jesus Christ is going to call you as well back to Genesis. Both of these are expressions that recur. In fact, um, if you recall from Genesis, Genesis has this recurring pattern, the book of the genealogy of. And what it's recurring, what it's doing there is it's, it's, it's recording for you the story of the generations, the line that is leading to the seed. That's the important thing in Genesis. People miss that. Okay, so the book of the generations of, okay, whatever. And nobody enjoys the genealogies of Genesis. They kind of read over them and, okay, quick, get through this as much as I can. But you're missing something. Genesis is showing you that the hope of humanity is the seed that was promised back in Genesis 3.15, the descendant of Eve. And so it's tracing out all of the lines of humanity, and it's tracing it from Adam and Eve, Noah, Abraham, and down from Abraham, Abraham's children. But the significance of all of that is God's promise to Abraham, you will have a descendant, and that descendant will be a blessing to the world. So that's the significance of the book of the generations of pattern in Genesis, to point out the seed, the descendant, the Messiah. And when I get here now to Matthew, then this becomes extraordinary, doesn't it? Here it is, again, the pattern, the book of the generation of Jesus. Jesus is the seed. Jesus is the Messiah. In fact, it's just a passing um, a point of trivia or interest here. But even the word here where it says generations, this is the word Genesis. And that's, of course, the word Genesis, or the name of the book Genesis, came to us. It's actually a Greek word, and it came to us because eventually the Old Testament is translated into Greek, and then here we are, and this is one of the words that's a pattern. So it's kind of a point of trivia a bit, but it is still a pointer back to a key word that was in the book of Genesis, the generations of pattern. That Jesus is the Messiah is even more important from another word in this phrase. And it's this word right here, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ. Okay, pause there for a second. We use the word Christ almost as though it were like a last name or something, right? And so, okay, Jesus Christ, it's just the two, the pieces go together, Jesus Christ. 
and we're missing something. It's not his last name, but the word Christ just means Messiah. And so right at the front doorstep of Matthew is the assertion, Jesus is the Messiah. I don't have time right now to build out what Messiah means. We did that in the last lecture, and there, there's much more that could be said. Old Testament passages that point to the Messiah. Daniel chapter 9 makes a big deal out of this. Psalm 2 makes a very big deal out of this, and other passages as well. Jesus is that one, the one who fulfills all of the promises of the Old Testament. The last piece of the first, though, is also significant now. I mean, every part is. The book of the generation of he fulfills the Genesis hopes. Jesus fulfills those hopes because Jesus is the Messiah, Jesus Christ, and the last two phrases, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Do you remember in our previous lecture, we looked at this uh, framework for the covenants or for the promises. And so we had Abrahamic, Davidic, new. And these new these covenants, the new covenant, and the promises to David, the promises to Abraham, all point to the seed. Okay. The language that you have here now, the son of David, the son of Abraham, is specifically linking Jesus Christ to all of those promises. Jesus Christ fulfills them. In fact, even the structure of the genealogy that follows, watch this. The structure begins with Abraham. Of course, it could have begun with Adam, but it's the Abrahamic promise that we're going to highlight here. Jesus is a descendant. He is the seed of Abraham. And starting from Abraham, you proceed downward until you get down to David. And so the next section of the genealogy, beginning with David, runs down through the remaining names. And you get down to the next marker, the time when they were brought to Babylon. And you run from that down to Jesus Christ. Now, in order to make that very clear, then, Matthew will give you dividers for these. Watch this. All the generations from Abraham to David from David until Babylon, from Babylon to the Messiah. And what he's doing is he's giving you markers, kind of time markers. He's, he's giving you divisions. There's a lot of more specific discussion about why and details, and there are some more complicated things going on probably. But one of the ideas here is it, just this simple. It's a way of Matthew dividing it up but he's not randomly just dividing it up. Oh, well, this is about the a right amount of time. But he's dividing it up to highlight something. Pay attention again. From Abraham to David. Abraham is a marker. David is a marker. The carrying away to Babylon is a marker. And then to the Messiah. And though it's not as explicit here in the case of the carrying away to Babylon, one of the points I made about the New Covenant was that it's connected to the exile. Israel is carried away into exile, and in exile, there are promises made God has not forgotten his people. No, he says, in fact, I will make a new covenant with you. I will even, I will articulate my promises again and even more fully. And I think what you've got going on in this genealogy are pointers to all three of the big genetic promises that were made to Israel and that were made to us anticipating the Messiah. Abraham, an entire connection to that. David, an entire connection to that. Even the new covenant through the exile, a connection to that. Jesus Christ fulfills all of those things. One other point to be made from the genealogy that I just find really beautiful. If you read back through the genealogy, you're going to see some, well, just honestly, some messy stuff. You're going to see in this genealogy reference to Rahab, which, okay, fill out what does the rest of your mind say? Rahab the harlot, the prostitute. You're going to have reference here to Ruth and the story of Ruth. We know if we go back into that, we check it out what's going on there. She's a Moabitess. Okay, she's a descendant. Remember, remember Lot and that thing that happened with his daughters? And Okay, and there, there's a curse on the Moabites. That's Ruth. There's a curse on this people, but she's part of the line. You've got the reference to Judah and how he, he had two children by Tamar. Tamar, that's that really distasteful incident. 
with um, the daughter-in-law and Judah won't give her a son as a husband. And so eventually she goes and she, she hides herself as though she's a prostitute and he commits immorality. And then there's this issue. He brings her out. She's going to be burned because of what she did. And she brings out the items. This is the man. Oh, oh, okay. It's that incident that we're talking about. A little bit later, you've got David and Bathsheba. You've even got things, Manasseh is part of this. Manasseh is part of this line. One of the worst kings in the entire history of Israel, arguably the worst. Okay, all of this kind of thing is in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And um, if you read that kind of thing, uh, you could even be tempted maybe in a, a fallen thinking kind of way. Say something like, ooh, I don't like that. I don't like it that there are wicked people in the line of Jesus. I, I would rather that Jesus have a nice, clean, righteous line. But here's an important point, actually, more than one. All of us are wicked. Th there, th a righteous line? What, what would that be anyway? And what, that make, what makes that even more significant now is a point that's going to be made right in the passage itself. Here, the promise is said to Joseph, Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. What is conceived of her is of the Holy Ghost. He will bring, or she shall bring forth a son. Thou shalt call his name Jesus. And here's the key line, For he shall save his people from their sins. And if the question goes, what people, what sins? There are a lot of ways to talk about that. One way to do that is just to look around. Another way to talk about that is to go forward in the book of Matthew and see all of the sin and the rejection and the, the awful things that are going to happen in this book. But an even simpler way is to just go up in the chapter and just work through some of these names, realizing that Every one of these names has a history, and some of them that we don't know, many of them that we do. And many of these names, you can go back like Manasseh, and you can go into the Old Testament, and you can see the wicked things they did. You can go back even in the story of David, and the story of what happened with Bathsheba, and, and you can recognize these are the people of Jesus. He came from sinners, for sinners, so that he could save his people. What people? Look at them. Look at the list. So that he could save his people from their sins. And there's plenty of sin to be forgiven. Jesus came to deal with that. Now, I want to give two, following that introduction, I want to give two comments about Matthew kind of overall. Um, think a little bit about the framework of Matthew and kind of see the big picture. Starting with this one, it's helpful to know the, the structure of Matthew and to recognize how these pieces fit together. So um, one of the things you can do as you go through Matthew is pay attention to the pattern of sermons and words, or excuse me, works and words. Okay, And here's the way I structured that here if you wanted to see it in this format. You can go down through the chapter and you can see a pattern of Jesus giving sermons or Jesus speaking, preaching, truth that he's sharing. So for instance, let's say the Sermon on the Mount, chapters five to seven, okay? Or you just keep on going and you, you have stretches of maybe one to three chapters where Jesus will be preaching, okay? The other thing that's interesting though is right after that, it will jump across to what I labeled actions, and on the action side of it, Jesus will go out and start doing miracles, start doing ministry. So you have sermons, actions, sermons, actions. And this pattern going back and forth is constant. Um, what is the theological significance of that? Well, I mean, it's a structural a kind of a, a pattern to give you um, a full-bodied understanding, a full, rich-orbed understanding of Jesus' ministry. And this would be a good summary of Jesus' ministry. He both proclaimed truth and he also did miraculous works. Okay, so that's a part of the pattern. But I think there's more. And, and I think the, the rest of the story is to say Jesus 
speaks or interprets about himself. This is my teaching. This is who I am. This is what I came to accomplish. This is how you must, must respond. And then he supports that in his actions. He preaches through his actions as well. And his actions become part of the proof that, that, that support and that demonstrate the reality of what he's preached. And the two are working together. Um, one other pattern you should recognize in respect to what I just mentioned. As you go, notice you'll have these summary miracle statements. Okay, so at the end of a string of miracles, Jesus might do 10 miracles. And at the end of a, a set of 10 miracles in one of these sections, it'll conclude by saying something like, and so he went to this region and all of their sick and all of their demon possessed came and he healed them all. Then Jesus went up to this place. He sat down and he began to preach. And that kind of pattern that all summary miracles, he healed all of their sick is I think another expression or another hint to say, yes, and there's so much more he did. You're only seeing just a small part of the richness of what Jesus did. So that's one concept, the structure of Matthew. A second concept I would like to, to explore and use now as an introduction um, into what we'll talk about next is the standard view of Matthew or the standard emphasis of Matthew that Matthew is the Jewish gospel. Okay, now, I've already hinted at something that is related to that. I introduced Matthew by calling it a bridge between the Testaments, right? And so as a bridge between the te two Testaments, and as recognizing that the Old Testament emphasizes or discusses, discusses or explores God's plans and God's working specifically within the nation of Israel, for the sake of the world, then we can recognize something like that. Okay, there are some notions here where I'm going to see what we might call a more Jewish emphasis. And some of the expressions are the ways that we see this kind of thing. For instance, Matthew will give specifically um, an angle on a, specific, a discussion of the Sabbath or a ceremonial question, something that has a, a Jewish concern to it. He spends a lot of time talking about conflict specifically with the rabbis or the Pharisees on issues of their law. And there are other expressions here in the book that are um, possibly distinctively Jewish in flavor. So we refer sometimes to Matthew as a very Jewish gospel. I would actually like to adjust that some. And, and you can start with this if you just recognize the framework I began with, Matthew as a bridge. Well, okay, fair enough. If it's coming from the Old Testament, I would expect there to be a Jewish orientation of some sort coming from the Old Testament. But if it's a bridge, it doesn't just come from somewhere, it goes somewhere. <laughs> there are two sides to a bridge, aren't there? And recognizing that then, in fact, what we discover is Matthew is a profoundly Jewish in the sense of exploring or, or raising the questions of the Old Testament background, but also a profoundly international gospel in the sense of moving us across that bridge, introducing the New Testament and emphasizing, as all the gospels do to some extent, emphasizing though that Jesus' salvation is for the world that Jesus' salvation is for all. It's not just a Jewish thing. This is for all. Let me talk then about some of the specific themes that are going to come up in Matthew in order to, 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 um, to help us understand those ideas. And I have several that we'll talk about here. Let me show you those first in an overall a summary framework so you can see what that looks like. And the frames that are the themes that I want to talk about are these. Jesus says king of the Jews related to that the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. Fulfillment, a huge idea across the gospel. Jesus relationship to the law. Jesus deity. I'm going to talk specifically about the triumphal entry, give us a little bit of insight specifically in that passage that captures some of the broader themes. Jesus in the future, two mentions of the church, father language, and the Great Commission. Okay, let's start with the first, King of the Jews and the Kingdom of God. Um, it's a well-recognized concept that Matthew will 
talk, remarkably so, about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. And this will come up a lot as you go across the gospel, just to give you a sense of what that looks like. Matthew starts off with John the Baptist proclaiming, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Then Jesus proclaims the same thing, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He went throughout their synagogues preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And when he comes then preaching within the Sermon on the Mount, you see the poor in spirit will receive the kingdom. Those who are persecuted will receive the kingdom. And it just continues on. You can continue through the book with a constant pattern like this. I would encourage you as you go, pay attention in the book of Matthew to this kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God language, because it's everywhere. What does that mean? Start with this and uh, important to recognize. Sometimes there have been people who argued that there was some kind of um, significant difference or distinction between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. So people who would say kingdom of heaven refers to one thing, the kingdom of God refers to another thing. And I would just like to point out passages like this that are going to show us that no, they're not. They're th these are the same thing. Here's one example, Matthew 19, 23. A rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than very parallel phrase, a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Okay, and so you have right within two verses, the same type of meaning. Uh, you have a similar thing here between Matthew 13, 11 and Luke 8, verse 10. Two passages I won't necessarily put up here, but they're parallel between two gospels. Matthew says kingdom of heaven, Luke says kingdom of God. Okay, and what that tells you is they're the same idea, different wording. Why did Matthew use kingdom of heaven? Uh, it's a little complicated. The traditional view has been that he was doing something um, like a Jewish way of expressing it. Maybe. It may also emphasize the contrast between heaven and earth. Way later, we're going to see all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And Matthew has an idea that surrounds some of that, that may be what's going on here. And I, I'm convinced that that probably is what's going on. In any case, kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God refer to the same thing. What do they refer to? To understand the concept of the kingdom, you are helped significantly by going back to actually the book of Daniel. And you can walk through the book of Daniel and you can look for this kingdom of God concept. The idea that God is the king over everything. God reigns. He is the king. But there's a bit more in how Daniel expresses this. Daniel chapter 2. In the days of these kings, what kings? Future kings. God shall set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. That kingdom shall not be left to another people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. And you could keep on going through the book of Daniel, but I'll just stop with that one phrase because I think that highlights our concept. There is a future kingdom that will overcome all other kingdoms. And the one kingdom, with Jesus as the king, will be the kingdom of the entire world. Jesus will reign forever and ever. And if I put that together then, I recognize that the kingdom refers to God's grand victory that is coming. God will rule and reign. Jesus Christ will rule and reign as the universal king. Think of the millennium now. And everyone who submits to his reign will enjoy the rich fruits and blessings of Jesus' reign. It's hope. There's a kingdom coming with Jesus as the king. And you can think of the kingdom of God every time that there's, uh, there are elections, every time there are political scandals, every time that a political leader fails, you just recognize, I'm waiting for Jesus to be my king. <laughs> there's a kingdom and Jesus will reign. That's where you want to go. Now, the remarkable argument of Matthew, though, is that the king has come. The king has come, and of course it's not yet the millennium, but the king has arrived. The king was on earth, and the peoples of this world rejected the righteous king. They crucified him. And yet all who will put their faith in this king 
already are able to be part of his future reign, his future kingdom. In fact, we are already enjoying his reign. Jesus is my king. Jesus is your king, if you're a believer. And the notion of the kingdom of God then has, yes, a future component. I'm waiting for the kingdom to come. When will the kingdom come? I'm longing for the kingdom to come. It also has a, a present component. I've already accepted Jesus as my king. Critically recognizing that Jesus is the beginning of the kingdom because Jesus is the king. And so it's centered around him. How then do I enter the kingdom? I need a relationship with him. I accept him as my king so that he reigns over me, so that I can already enjoy the beginnings of some of the blessings of the kingdom. He's already my king today, but there's so much more to look forward to. The kingdom is ultimately future, the millennium, eternity, Jesus reigning over me as my king. And that's the whole concept that's going on here in the book of Matthew. As you walk then through the book of Matthew and you see this kingdom of God language, those are the frameworks, those are the ideas you have to be thinking as you're looking at this. The future coming kingdom, Jesus as the king, all who accept him are part of that kingdom. In fact, can already get ahead of things and start enjoying blessings of the kingdom right now having relationship with Jesus Christ, the King. The irony of that, the richness of that, is that you're going to see language coming along at different points in the book of Matthew. Things like, here is Jesus, the King of the Jews. And you, you possibly can scratch your head a little bit. Okay, what's happening here? And it's this emphasis. Jesus is the true king. They might reject him. They might ignore him. They might crucify him. It doesn't change the reality that he is the king. You're going to have really fascinating statements where Jesus will say something like, the kingdom of God is in your midst. Or the kingdom is now. And language like this that, what? And the answer is, because the king has come. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Here it is. Why? Because the king has come. The king has arrived. And because he's here, the kingdom of heaven, or the kingdom of God, has already begun. It started ahead of time, but it's arrived in the person of Jesus Christ. That's going to connect us to my second big concept I want to talk about in Matthew. And it's the concept of fulfillment or fulfilling. So once again, you can go through the entire book and you're just going to see this constantly, this kind of fulfill or fulfilling or fulfillment language. Uh, let me just show you a little bit of what that looks like. And we can walk through like this. Um, starting out in Matthew, constant notion. This was to fulfill or this fulfilled. So for instance here, it was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of by the Lord. That it might be fulfilled, then was fulfilled, and it might be fulfilled, that it might be fulfilled. And even Jesus' own words, till heaven and earth pass, nothing will pass from the law till all will be fulfilled. Keep on going, it's constant through the book. What's going on with this? What's happening is that Matthew is emphasizing Jesus coming and Jesus' ministry was not just any sort of passing detail. That this was actually all in the plan of God. Significantly, massively planned and organized by him to demonstrate all the things that happened are exactly according to his purpose. You're going to see this kind of concept in a, a couple of dramatic express, expressions. Let me show you here two of them. Matthew 16, from that time, Jesus began to show unto his disciples how he must go into Jerusalem, suffer many things, be killed and be raised again the third day. This isn't using the fulfill language, but just notice the language here that he must. Some translations will say that it was necessary. Matthew 26, how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled? that thus it must be. And what that means is people coming out to take him by force, to take him like a prisoner. All of this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. And it's giving you this very strong theme and um, emphasis and reminder 
that all of the events you're reading in the book of Matthew are they're just fulfillments of things God told you would happen. It's almost like if you were watching a movie and, you know, at the beginning, like a child is born and suddenly uh, out pops some magician type person and proclaims over the child, here is the destiny of this child and gives a word of prophecy about the child and then disappears. And everyone says, oh no, we can try to do something about it. And so they all try to chime in there together and make it impossible for those things to happen. And the irony of the story goes, typical fairy tale, that the very attempts to stop those things from happening create the very set of events that lead to this child fulfilling everything that was prophesied about. And you know, these kinds of notions. And, and you almost have something like that, an irony to the story of Jesus, particularly of his death and crucifixion, that everything that the Old Testament told you, predicting and predicting over and over again, here now you get to Matthew, you get to the Gospels, and it happens exactly like God told you it would happen. There are no accidents here. Everything was according to God's plan. There is one other very important pattern with fulfilled or fulfillment. And it's not just the pattern of prophecy, as in Jesus saying, well, this was already prophesied about me. But here is an emphasis that now will shape our next discussion or the next section. And it's Jesus in relationship to the law. That's my next topic. What is Jesus' relationship to the law? And why this is significant? Well, Sometimes when we talk about Jesus and the law, I, I hear it said something like, well, Jesus broke the law, or Jesus violated the Sabbath law, or um, Jesus set aside the law. And, and the notion here goes of, we're, we're bringing in some bad understanding of later statements in the New Testament, law versus gospel. Here's law, bad. Here's gospel, good. And so they're fighting, and gospel overcomes law. Or a notion somehow that Jesus finally gave freedom from the law, meaning Jesus took the law, you know, wadded it up, threw it in the trash can, and now it's done. And we have to watch a little more closely and a little more carefully to what's actually going on in Matthew, starting with this statement. And you've got to understand and appreciate this statement. Matthew 5, 17, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Verily I say to you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle, one little tiny stroke, or almost like a, not quite, but like a punctuation mark almost, a tiny little detail shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Okay, so you can see, connected to my last theme, twice here, fulfilled and here fulfill. Jesus came to fulfill the law. But together with that, here the wording, I came not to destroy the law. I am come not to destroy, but to fulfill. Another word you could put here would be like abolish, set aside, um, dismiss. Okay? And so sometimes with working with this or discussing this question, I've even asked classes before something. You say, okay, I read the verse. And then after we read the verse, I say to the class, okay, what do you think? Did Jesus yes or no, or something in between, <laughs> it's fine. Did Jesus abolish the law? Did Jesus set aside the law? And uh, sometimes I'll get the answer, yes. Okay, Jesus, Jesus abolished the law, okay. Let's try again. Let's read the verse, okay, so here it is. Think not that I am come to destroy or abolish the law. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Okay, so there we read the verse, now all right, try again. Do you think Jesus came to destroy or to abolish the law? Um, I really think he did. Oh, okay. Let's go back. Let's try reading the verse. Think not that I... <laughs> so you can see the pattern here. And the point is to say, we've got a, a strain of thinking that is exactly what Jesus told us not to think. He told us, don't think that. And so if, if you do think that, you have broken Jesus' thought. You have violate, you've done exactly what he told you not to do. Don't think that Jesus came to destroy the law. <laughs> All right, watch what keeps on, what happens though. I am come not to destroy, but to fulfill. And there's the rest of our idea. 
we have an idea that's not well it, it is wrong but it, it, there's a piece of it that we're we're trying to grasp after something and so okay i understand where we got there we recognized that something changed in respect to the law because of jesus fair enough and that's that's good that's valid something did change because jesus came because jesus came our relationship to the law is different quite different but it's not because Jesus abolished the law. It's because he fulfilled or he completed the law. Jesus took the law and brought it to its end point. He brought it to its conclusion so that the demands of the law are now answered. The, the, the struggles of the law are now fulfilled. That here, the, the struggle of people to keep the law, it is only possible because of him because he's the only person that, that ever has, has. The prophecies of the law all point to him. And even some of the specific details like sacrifices and some of the ceremonial requirements reach their end point, their conclusion, they, they, their purpose is fulfilled in him. He did what they predicted, what they pointed to. And for that reason, aspects of the law are set aside better, fulfilled, fulfilled because of Jesus, because he has completed the law. Why then do we have the issue of conflict going on throughout the book? For instance, um, when the Pharisees will come to him and they'll say, well, you've broken our Sabbath laws. You're not washing your hands properly. You're healing people on the Sabbath, particularly that the Sabbath is a recurring issue. So what's going on with that? And the answer is understand it properly, it's not that Jesus broke the Old Testament law. It's that Jesus broke their traditions that were layered on top of the law. What's going on in so many of these places? Jesus is the ultimate law fulfiller. Jesus obeys the law better than anyone who ever came before. So instead of looking at it and saying Jesus is a law breaker, that's a God forbid kind of thing. May it never be, using Paul's language. No, Jesus is not a law breaker. Never say that. Jesus is a law fulfiller. What he broke were the traditions that they added on top of the law. Jesus shows what true law fulfillment looks like. And as you read through the book of Matthew, you'll see that. There is, however, as I said earlier, a sense in which Jesus is part of the shift. You remember this Old Testament, New Testament framework I gave you. And so you have the two arrows coming down like an hourglass type of figure. And what stands at the center is the cross. Okay. Well, one of the big things that changes across the Testaments is our relationship to law. And, and I'd like to point out here, what turns that entire flow is the cross. Because Jesus has come, everything changes. Jesus and his cross, that is the marker that stands at the center of salvation history. And so because of him, everything has shifted. And therefore, as a New Testament believer, if you look back and you say, okay, but I, I see a lot of things changed from the Old Testament. Why? The answer is that cross. That cross defines it. A couple of reasons that I will highlight, I'm limited here just for sake of time, but I'll show you two passages that highlight Jesus is the one who brings about that shift. Here's one. On the Sabbath day, they're going through, they're plucking corn. The Pharisees are upset. You're breaking the Sabbath day. Okay. Keep on reading. Jesus' appeal is actually to the law. It's not that Jesus says, I'm going to break the law. Here, watch this. Jesus answer, have you not read? Or have you not read in the law? In other words, Jesus' argument is not, forget the law, it's no longer relevant. He appeals to the law to answer them. Why? Because they had added tradition. Jesus says, actually, you don't understand the original. The original law is the clearer. But then he's going to keep on going. Watch this point. I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. And furthermore, the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. And what Jesus has just done is not to say that the law is abolished, not to say that the temple doesn't matter, 
But what he has emphasized here is that he himself is the greater. Furthermore, in reference to the Sabbath laws, he is the law giver. I'm in charge of the Sabbath. I'm the one who gave the Sabbath laws, and I can definitively, authoritatively tell you what that means. I am not, in this sense, under the law. He did obey the law. But I'm not under the law as its servant. I am the law giver. I define the law. I'll tell you what the law is. And that's fitting my idea again. Jesus is not breaking the law. Never say that. Jesus is fulfilling the law. He's bringing it to its end point, to its completion. Another passage that works like this, I wish we could look at it in more detail, is a bit later in Matthew 17. This is the issue where they come and they ask for tribute money. We hear this and we think taxes, and so we think government. You have to know a little bit more about what's the, the language that's used here. This is a temple tax. And so it's actually something related to the religion, the temple. Okay. And so, do we pay money or not? And that's the question. And Jesus' answer here is, of whom do the kings of the earth take custom? Of their own children or of strangers? And Peter says, of the strangers. Then are the children free. What Jesus is saying here, and the richer picture of this, is to say, okay, I mean, he goes ahead and he pays the tax. But his basic argument is, I'm the Lord of the temple. My father is the one who owns the temple. It's my father's house. And in that sense, then, I'm greater than the temple. And so, okay, we'll obey this for the sake of, of them. But Jesus transcends even the temple itself and transcends the law because he is the law giver. Well, for sake of time, we need to move to the next theme, and this is Jesus' deity. Jesus' deity, we can emphasize or we can illustrate through multiple different streams throughout the book. But here, I'll just show you a group of these, a more limited group of them that we'll talk about for sake of time. And that is to emphasize Jesus' deity, we're going to see the actions that he does. Jesus forgives sin. Jesus speaks as the law giver. Jesus is the standard of righteousness or the standard of being justified. Jesus is the source of truth. Jesus is the eschatological judge, the future end times judge. I'd love to look at these in more depth with you. I can't, just for sake of time. But here we'll start with this. Jesus forgives sins. All of this illustrating that Jesus is truly God. And here, the passage we're talking about is Matthew 9, 5, that they bring up this issue, do you really have the right to say that you can forgive sins? And so he proves it, that you may know that the Son of Man has the authority, the right, the power on earth to forgive sins. Jesus can forgive sins, and in the passage, in the context, they have just asked, who can forgive sins but God alone? Right. <laughs> right. Jesus is the new lawgiver. This is going from Matthew 5. And if you walk through Matthew 5, here, I'll just change our coloring for us here. If you walk through Matthew 5, you're going to see a pattern. You have heard, but I say unto you. I say unto you. I say unto you. I say unto you. And if you keep on going with that pattern all the way to the end of the chapter, or the, excuse me, the end of the sermon, the end of the, the, the sermon ends with them looking back at everything he said and they're really in awe because they say, we've never heard someone speak with such authority. Verse chapter 7, verse 29, he taught as having authority and not as the scribes. But you realize what's going on in the original context in Matthew 5? You have heard, but I say. The you have heard side, in many cases, is just tradition. Okay, so that's a human thing. In some cases, there's an element of it that is... God's original law. Okay, and it's not completely just God's original law, but it's kind of mixed in there. And so part of what Jesus is doing is he's saying, okay, you've heard traditions, people tell you this, that's wrong, I'm telling you this. This is the original, okay? Sweep away all of the things people have added and encrusted, and here is the true. Okay, that's part of the idea. But there's a bit more to it. And you realize Jesus is stepping in and saying, 
I have the authority to declare to you what is the true law, what is the true word of God. I say to you, someone could say, well, I don't care what you think, but Jesus won't allow that. You have to care what he thinks. Jesus is the lawgiver. Next point to demonstrate Jesus' deity here. Jesus and relationship to him is the standard of life and of righteousness. So let me show you what I mean by that. Whoever receives one such little child in my name receives me. A little child who believes in me, you dare not offend. Or similar to that. I say unto you, those who have followed me in the regeneration. Or everyone that forsaketh not father, mother, sister, brother, for my name's sake. And if you process what he's saying there, the marvel of it goes, he's actually claiming if you're faithful and loyal to me, you will be accepted. I will define for you the standard of acceptance or rejection. Relationship to Jesus defines life. Relationship to Jesus is a life or death matter. Part of that then also is because Jesus is the true source of truth. That's our next concept here, demonstrating the deity of Christ. Jesus is the true source of truth, and we see this in passages like this. Do not be called rabbi, for one is your master, your teacher, your rabbi, the Messiah. Call no man on earth, call no man your father. One is your father, the one in heaven. Do not be called masters, one is your master, even Christ. Okay, here's what's fascinating to me about this. I have a kind of an ABA pattern here. So the pattern A, your master, even Christ, your master, even Christ. The pattern B in the middle, one is your father. Okay, but they're parallel. Do not because one is. Do not because one is. But if you're processing what's happening here, at the before and after, one is your master, the Messiah. One is your master, the Messiah. And standing in the middle, one is your father, God. And what Jesus has just done in so many words is to say, there is, remember the Shema, there, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord. There is one source of truth, Ecclesiastes will say. There is one shepherd. There is one source of wisdom. God alone gives wisdom, Job's concept. God alone gives wisdom. And here it is in the middle, your father which is in heaven alone gives wisdom. But either, on either side of that, parallel to that, there is one, yes, the Messiah, which Matthew has presented is Jesus. Jesus is presenting himself as the one source of truth, the divine source of truth. Jesus defines truth. And if you listen to Jesus and if you accept his words, you are accepted. By him. It's an extraordinary claim. Uh, one more just final um, expression of this, and it's in Matthew chapter 7. And Matthew chapter 7, Jesus is going to end out with the very familiar story of the, the man who built his house upon the rock and the man who built his house upon the sand. But here, you should notice one other interesting pattern about that emphasis. Notice the standard. Whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, go a little further. Everyone that hears these sayings of mine and does them not. And my point on that is to say that standard between life and death is hearing Jesus' words and doing them. Hearing Jesus' words brings you life. Rejecting Jesus' words brings you death. Jesus' words define the difference. <laughs> That's an amazing claim. What that leads to ultimately then is that Jesus is the eschatological or the future end times judge. And that's going to, again, demonstrate his deity. All of this underneath the heading Jesus deity. And here it is. Many will say to me, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied and so forth. And Jesus will answer to them. I will profess unto them. I never knew you. Depart from me. Here, he's going to talk about the parable of the tares. And so he'll say, let both grow together into the harvest in the time of harvest. But Jonas, just notice this. I will say to the reapers, gather together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them. Gather the wheat into my barn. And he's using first person pronouns. I will say, 
Another passage that works like this doesn't use first person, but it will say the Son of Man will sit upon his throne. Well, Jesus has referred to himself as the Son of Man all throughout his ministry. The point of it is Jesus is making a claim here that it is a claim to deity because specifically he's claiming that he will sit upon the throne and judge the world someday. The world will come and Jesus will sort out those who are accepted from those who are rejected and Jesus decides the difference. It's an amazing claim to deity. And fitting then with what I've argued here, these five points, this declares Jesus' deity. He forgives sins. He speaks as the new lawgiver. He is the standard of righteousness, the source of truth, and the future judge. We often think of John as the book that's going to talk about Jesus' deity, and I don't have a problem necessarily with that. John does emphasize Jesus' deity in, in fabulous ways. But we should recognize that all of the Gospels do. And we should recognize that Matthew does in amazing ways. We have one or two more headings to come through. One of those now is to talk about the concept of the triumphal entry. And for sake of time and just the limitations of what we can do, I'm mainly just going to show you a graphic. But with the triumphal entry, here's what I want you to realize. You read this passage, okay, and we're familiar with, okay, the triumphal entry passage. But you miss something if you don't realize that there is all kinds of Old Testament background tied in with this. We're pulling in all kinds of Old Testament passages to support what's happening in the triumphal entry. And let me show you what I mean by that. So we have this kind of pattern. What I've done in the middle, I've put the triumphal entry passage. I'll just show you an example here, for instance. Tell the daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh to thee, meek sitting upon an ass, a colt, the foal of an ass. Okay, so here you have the original statement in Matthew. That's the Matthew statement. What you have to know is that's taken from Zechariah. And you can see the language right here, upon the colt, the foal of an ass. Okay, and you can keep on going in the passage to realize that prophecy, though, is bigger. Look, the king is righteous, bringing salvation. He will speak peace to the heathen, and he will reign over the world. All of that is in Zechariah. And so to have this quotation here, and to say that Jesus fulfills that prophecy, is to say that Jesus is the king of the world. There's a lot more going on when you go back and you look at the original context of the passage it came from. The same with other passages here. Hosanna to the son of David, Hosanna in the highest. And if you go back, you're going to see an extended passage here from Psalm 118. And you're going to see patterns in here that are beautiful. For instance, the stone which the builder refused is become the head of the corner. Okay, And you can do this with multiple passages. One more that's obvious here is Psalm 8. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, you have perfected praise. Psalm 8 is going to talk about man, the son of man, given glory and honor and reigning over all things. Okay. And just to summarize that passage then, the triumphal entry passage with at least these three, possibly other allusions, but these three main passages explicitly quoted, it's going to emphasize three things. The king is coming. No, he came. The king came, he came humbly, and he came for the purpose of salvation. Those three ideas. He came as king, he came in humility, and he came to bring salvation. All wrapped up in this triumphal entry passage. I would commend to you the richness of study here around Matthew 21 and the triumphal entry and paying attention to the passages that come out of it and the themes that come out of it the coming of Jesus as king, humbly, and for the purpose of salvation. It's a beautiful passage. Another thing that we need to know about Matthew is to recognize two mentions, what I'm referring to, two mentions of the church. And let me just show you the, the, the two passages first, and then let me explain their significance. So you have two places in Matthew where Jesus refers to this, the congregation, or the assembly, or the group of people. And here, one of them is in Matthew 16, a very, very significant passage in the flow of the book. I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church. The second passage, similar to it, Matthew 18, if a person refuses to listen, tell it to the church. If he refuses even to listen to the church, let it be to you as a Gentile. 
and a as a tax collector. Why do I bring up these two passages? What's significant about them? What's well, going to lead to a concept we'll talk about in just a moment, which is that Jesus does not just assume his ministry during his life, it's just that. He does not assume that it's just his ministry and then it's done, but he assumes that and he teaches that. There's going to be a continuation of what he did in the lives of other people. There is a church coming. There is a movement that will follow. There are people that will extend his ministry and continue what he did. And when I say his ministry, I'm talking more than just about his his practical work, but I'm talking about specifically his relationship with the Father. So let me show you another theme before we come to the Great Commission passages. And um, just so that you're aware of it and so that you pay attention to it. Jesus refers constantly to my Father which is in heaven. My Father which is in heaven. My Father, my Father. And it's actually very extensive all the way through the book. Okay, well that's fascinating enough. But here's the fascinating thing further is he doesn't just refer to my father, but now he's going to extend that and he's going to refer to, with the disciples, your father. And why I highlight that point or why I think this is significant, this language, speaking of God as father, that existed in the Old Testament and that was common within Judaism, common enough. But the concept of saying, my father, Speaking of God in that kind of direct way like that was unusual. And for Jesus then to talk about my father was dramatic enough. The idea that he personally would have a direct relationship with God. But he extends it, your father. The idea that people would refer to the holy God as their personal father. Not just father, but my father, our father. What Jesus has done is he's moved from his relationship with God to say that relationship belongs to you now. If you have relationship with me, you have relationship also with the Father. That's an extraordinary and amazing claim, a dramatic claim that did not have a precedent in Jesus' time in uh, broad Judaism. That brings us to the Great Commission passage. You know the passage, Matthew 8, 20, 28, 19, and 20. Therefore, he says, I have received all authority over heaven and earth. All things now belong to me because of my victory. And so therefore, he says, go and teach all nations. It's universal. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And here is the basis or the confidence in that, lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world, when you are teaching them to observe whatever I have commanded you. Okay, a couple of comments about that that make this statement significant and why we talk about this as the Great Commission. Number one, we recognize this is based on his universal authority. Jesus Christ now reigns over heaven and earth. All things belong to him. And in fact, that's expressed in very universal language. I'd like you to notice about the Great Commission, Great Commission passage, the words all and every and the universal notions. So you have things like this in Jesus' statements, that all authority has been given to me. Teach all nations. Teach them to observe all things I have commanded you. I am with you all way. It's a universal, even unto the end of the world, all time until the end. And what we've got here then is a strong emphasis to say, Jesus is in charge of all of it, no exceptions, nothing left out. There is no corner of planet Earth where his reign does not extend. In fact, that authority extends like this, teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. I mentioned this earlier, Jesus' words define life. Well, think about this. Jesus did not just give uh, kind of a set of philosophy ideas, you know, try to be at peace with yourself, try to empty yourself of all desire or something like that. It's not just a philosophy, it's instructions. It's practical. It's things you must do for all of life. Together with that, recognize that he doesn't just give instructions for the disciples, 
but it's for the disciples of the disciples and the disciples of the disciples of the disciples. Jesus expects this to be passed on. Teach them to observe everything I have commanded you. Jesus' authority is so absolute, it echoes across the ages. Jesus speaks with authority 2,000 years ago, and 2,000 years later, we hear his words and we must obey because of his authority echoes all the way through the generations, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded. And where I think that leaves us then in the flow of the Gospel of Matthew and in our understanding of the New Testament, it leaves us with a basic question, so am I a faithful disciple or not? Jesus came, the Messiah, fulfilling the Abrahamic, Davidic, and New Covenants. He came fulfilling all of the promises and all of the expectations of the Old Testament, fulfilling the law. He comes as fully God. He comes as the law giver and the law fulfiller. He comes with total and absolute authority. And he stands at the end of the book and he says, having received all authority over all things, I command you, obey my words, be a disciple, be a follower of me, all the way to the end of time. And the question then becomes, am I a faithful follower? Am I a person under the authority of Jesus? Am I doing all that he commanded me to do? There is a, a, a last um, coloring to this promise or to this command, just to notice, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. I think that cuts two directions. Here is an assurance. If you're in duress, if you're in stress, if you're facing persecution, if people are telling you that you cannot proclaim the gospel, do not fear. I am with you always. It cuts another direction. If you are tempted to not take Jesus' words seriously, to undermine his authority, to ignore his right to tell you what to do, just so you know, he is with you. Always. <laughs> he stands there beside you and he holds you accountable. Jesus' authority is absolute. Are we faithful disciples? Do we follow his words? And I hope the book of Matthew will cause us to take his words seriously and to respond in faith and in obedience. Go and make disciples. Go and be a disciple. Because Jesus fulfills all of the, author all of the commands and all of the expectations of the Old Testament. And Jesus speaks with universal authority. Jesus Christ as the messianic king who reigns forever.